Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. We're going to hold a minute and uh, just let some of the stragglers uh, join the webinar. All right, thanks for the people who have joined in the last minute. We're just going to wait one more minute and let people finish getting set up. Hello, and welcome to our Marketing Analytics and Olympics training event. Um, I first would like to say a big thank you to L&T for inviting Unruly to present today and to share our Olympics analytics. I'm Deborah Prywood. I head up Insights and Marketing at Unruly, and I'm based out of our New York U.S. headquarters. At Unruly, we're in the business of getting videos watched, shared, and loved. We've used data, tech, and emotional targeting to launch ads to the audiences who love them best. And today I'm going to talk about how brands, big and small, can use and release data and insight to make and launch the ads that will be the talk of the Rio Games. So the Rio Games begin August 5th. Is your brand in shape? Whether you're a sponsor or just wanting to crash this zeitgeist event, I'm going to talk about the training regimen to help you meddle in online video this summer and all year round. I'll be sharing data from tracking the past few Olympics, 
social engagement metrics based on tracking about 3 trillion video views, and emotional analytics from testing ads that have already launched from the 2016 games. This will show you how you can harness emotional advertising and measure the emotional impact, as well as brand and business metrics from your online apps. And the great news is there are a number of intense emotions already baked into the Olympics. So if you're launching video this summer, you're doing so from an elevated playing field. So this is my credibility building slide. In addition to having loads of data, we know what to do with it, so you're in good hands. Our video analytics predictions and recaps have been featured in publications around the world. And we love video and want to help marketers succeed, so we're really happy to share. So figured we'd start things off with a quiz and see who can impress Michaela. So question number one, um, and please just post your answers into the comment field. Um, we'll take a look and have some fun. What was the most shared ad from Sochi in 2014? Was it P&G's Pick Them Up, Nike's Play Russian, or Channel 4's Game Mountain? P&G won gold with nearly 700,000 shares with Pick Them Up. We'll be talking a lot about shares as an important KPI for video today. Sharing is the deepest form of engagement, and in the case of this video, over 692,000 people stopped what they were doing to share P&G's ad. That's making a deep connection with consumers. This is powerful e-word of mouth and advocacy, and it also drives earned media. But even if sharing isn't your end game, engagement should be. That means you've gotten your viewers' attention and your message is resonating with them. And they're connecting with your brand. The key to driving shares and engagement is making an emotional connection. All right, so question number two, what's the most shared Olympic ad of all time? We have the Canadian Institute um, for Diversity and Inclusion's Luge ad, Nike's The Jogger, and also P&G's Best Job. And P&G won gold again with over 2.4 million shares for this ad. Our last question is summer or winter, which games share more? And not to leave the witness, but you do need to consider time and the video watching technology shift that took place in the two years between 2012 and 2014. And that was sort of a trick question. But um, even when you consider the increased numbers of devices in market, growth in video sharing platforms and the people using them, the brand content and ads from the 2012 Summer Games were still more widely seen and shared. So also, we've excluded the P&G Hero ads from each of these Olympics as they were runaway outliers. Um, and still the shares were 89% greater in 2012. Of course, the online ads for the Summer Games were more heavily invested in. Um, you can see here there are more views and views are largely representative of budget, which also helped that sharing cause. It's interesting to see that the share rate for the 2014 Winter Games ads was higher. Olympics advertisers had gotten better at making content, and the shares as a percentage of views metric, um, which we use to help normalize for budget, increased. All right, so even though we're here to talk about the Olympics, we're going to take a step back um, and take a Super Bowl timeout. So we kicked off the year with a major sporting event, the Super Bowl, and let's see what we can learn from it. Uh, we're polishing off this year's insights, which we'll be releasing in the coming weeks. And here's a sneak peek to what the folks who come into our future video lab can see when we launch this workshop. So there were three key reasons that shares fell year over year for Super Bowl ads. We tested ads against a panel of over 16,000 people, and on average, 59% of them hadn't seen the Super Bowl ads on any device. So there were massive coverage gaps. And when you factor in the cost of Super Bowl airtime, or in this case, an Olympic sponsorship, or even just creating and investing in online video, you don't want to miss more than 50% of your audience. And we'll talk about how to avoid this. Uh, the second key learning, four out of five of the top shared Super Bowl brands aired and launched more than one ad during the broadcast as well as online. So with the 17-day span of the summer games, Brands will definitely want to use multiple creatives to avoid ad fatigue and keep audiences engaged, and also giving them their choice to share the ads that resonate most for them. 
The last key learning. The Super Bowl ads triggered really similar emotional profiles. So the ads just weren't overly memorable and the creatives just blended together for viewers. And that's one of the reasons that, you know, the Super Bowl ads, Super Bowl ads this year were just considered lukewarm. All right, but back to Rio. So here's our Rio rundown to kind of level set and get us on the same playing field. Um, the summer games start August 5th, and they run for over two weeks. Sponsorship costs are steep at $200 million. Um, but NBC, right, they expect more viewers than ever before, with over 3.5 billion people expected to tune in. And they're also striking deals with social networks like Snapchat and Facebook. And the USOC has updated their rules, and non-sponsors have more options than ever before, including using Olympians in their ads with some notable caveats. Non-sponsors can run ads throughout the Olympic period, and this is an equal opportunity for brands big and small, right? From, you know, behemoth brands like P&G to small and medium-sized businesses to make an emotional connection. Online video can be the great equalizer, and in some cases has turned smaller brands into household names, like Dollar Shave Club. So here are our 10 steps to help your content with goals at the Olympic Games. Number one, emotions are key in getting people to engage with your content. On a scale of 1 to 10, aim to hit an 11. Uh, but all joking aside, you know, really you should be aiming to hit a 9 or a 10 on that intensity scale using the emotions that make sense for your brand. But people don't experience the same emotional reactions, even to the same piece of content. So here we're looking at older millennial men, aged 25 to 34, and this is the most emotional demo, over-indexing for 14 of the 18 psychological responses that we measure. You can feel free to offer emotional depth for these guys. Um, you know, anything from amazement to happiness to warmth to surprise. Um, you know, it doesn't just need to be funny or, or gross. If these emotions are present at all in a video, they're more likely to experience it than the average viewer. But it's different for millennial women of the same age. They experience far fewer emotions with warmth resonating most greatly for them. Does this mean that if your ad is using another emotion, um, you know, and you're targeting these women with other things, you're doomed? No, not at all. But quantifying emotions in this way can show you that you'll have to work harder to generate a strong emotional response. And of course, if warmth does make sense for your brand, then you'll be ahead of the curve. So we test creative using Unruly Share Rank to predict how an ad will perform, how shareable or viral the content will be, what its effect will be on driving purchase intent and brand favorability, and we also show the scene-by-scene -scene analysis of engagement to show what's driving the various responses. It's good to know what's driving engagement with your audiences so you can leverage this throughout your marketing campaign. This doesn't just need you know, to be how you, how you launch your video asset. Um, you can use it in your headlines, you can use it in your descriptions, in your native descriptions, in your PR, and even when choosing promotional gifts, you might want to do so based on the peaks of the emotional response for your video. All right, step two, leverage pride, inspiration, and zeitgeist. So emotions tend uh, trend seasonally, and global sporting events tend to trigger inspiration and pride, and people share to be part of the zeitgeist. So here are three of the popular ads from the Sochi Games, tying in with relatable themes of moms and kids, sports, and even a twist on Russia's controversial gay rights stance, um, in this case with Channel 4, promoting gay pride. Knowing the key emotions can help you ride that wave and have viewers experience them at elevated levels, or you might choose to counter-program and pick different emotions to help your ads pop from the clutter. And there will be clutter these Olympic Games. NBC has announced that they plan to air over 6,700 hours of content, of Olympics content, and release it across their 11 linear networks and various digital properties. And this is only the official stuff. There's going to be loads of additional coverage. Emotions are key, and again, advertisers should think about the one to three key emotions that are most authentic for your brand. And whichever emotions you choose to trigger, please be sure to brand your spot well to get the most ROI. Our data, as well as that from Dr. Karen Nelson Field, who's sourced on this slide, and other academics, has found that there are zero, there's zero correlation between branding and shareability. 
So if you're going to invest in a video and distribute it online, please make sure people know it's from you so they can remember you at point of purchase. Think globally. In any global sporting event, it can be difficult to list and shift across territories. We have 12 share rank algorithms around the world, taking into account different cultural differences and variations, and we've seen that happiness is a global trigger. But then the different regions tend to lean in and engage when different emotions are present. So in Brazil, which is home of the Rio Games, exhilaration comes in at number two, which is likely to be highly present in the ads and footage surrounding the Summer Olympics. Non-sponsors can meddle. So I mentioned earlier that online video is the great equalizer, and that strong content and savvy distribution are two sides of the coin for success, so that $200 million sponsorship fee might be re better reinvested in distribution, distribution for smaller advertisers. And sponsors should definitely make sure that they have their online audience covered as well to make the most of their investment. In the most recent Olympics in 2014, two of the three top ads on the podium came from crashers. P&G won gold with Pick Them Back Up, and then the other two Zeitgeist tie-ins from Channel 4 and a Canadian nonprofit took home silver and bronze. And speaking of Zeitgeist, tying in with some of these perennial trends is a great way to elevate your video's opportunities to be shared. These are all recent and currently ongoing trends. And using them can help leverage the ongoing zeitgeist and then harness the emotions that are intrinsic in these. So for example, a recent trend is um, brands releasing heritage ads and kind of touting their decades and even centuries um, in the business. And for heritage ads, they tend to use the more rare and therefore more attention-getting emotions, like pride and nostalgia. And dads and dogs have emotions baked in, which is one of the key reasons they tend to make strong connections with viewers. So these can be mixed and matched, and we're already seeing advertisers take an Olympics twist on them, as we're seeing more kid empowerment and Olympian fem empowerment and advertising ads already hitting. So there are some don'ts when it comes to trend advertising. Don't force your brand into a trend. It's important to make sure that the trend makes sense for you, that it's on brand and you know in line with what people out in the world think of your brand already. Um, don't be late to the party. It's important to be timely and relevant. And then, of course, you know, don't skip on quality and haste you know, to kind of get an ad out quickly. Make it good. Um, you know, it's okay to skip if the timing or the trend doesn't make sense for you. But if you do choose to participate, hopefully your ad will be useful and entertaining. All right, so number six, it's really important to target the people who will most value your ad. So when people are more emotionally engaged, brand recall, attention, engagement, and purchase intent all increase. So you want to target this guy, right? This, this really excited fan in a sea of people. This is the person who is most likely to engage with your ad. Here's an example from the Super Bowl. One of the most talked about ads from Super Bowl 50 was Mountain Dew's Puppy Monkey Baby. And when we tested this ad for engagement and shareability, its share rank score was just above average, hurt by negative responses of confusion and disgust, especially amongst older viewers. Brand promoter results were really interesting. Puppy Monkey Baby achieved one of the highest brand promoter scores of all Super Bowl ads among millennial males at 65%. But you can see here that the average US viewer was not a big fan, and they were you know, giving a lot of negative word of mouth to this ad higher than the US norm. So by testing to see who will love or hate your ad and targeting accordingly, smart advertisers can focus on reaching brand promoters and not waste budget on brand attractors. You'll need to make your ad discoverable where people are already consuming content. So this is a great way to avoid coverage gaps. If your ad is discoverable to your target audiences and the environment where they're already watching video on a regular basis, you'll be in better shape. So in the U.S., about a quarter of video views take place on YouTube, about 13% are taking place on Facebook, and the vast majority of video views take place on the 1 billion plus websites that make up the open web that consumers are visiting on a daily basis. 
So this isn't 1989, and this isn't your field of dreams moment. It's not an if you build it, they will come type of situation. Instead, it's about surfacing your content for your audience on YouTube, Facebook, and beyond. You want to reduce gaps across screens as well. So I love this, um, this, this bit of data and want to point out that U.S. viewers are watching content across a number of devices in any given day. And it isn't just the old ones, which is why we're showing you both U.S. millennials and the average population. So while millennials love their mobiles, the laptop is still the number one connected device for both a NatRep audience and a millennial audience. 76% of millennials watched video on a laptop in the last 30 days. So focusing on just one device or a couple of devices can leave large portions of your audience uncovered. You want to be everywhere your target consumer is. Timing matters. And when it comes to the summer game, you'll want to start training really early. So here we're looking at data, um, the peaks of engagement from the 2012 London Games. We can see that Adidas opened and closed the last Summer Olympic sharing season. They released a TV ad in April and then released an ad celebrating their UK athletes after the Games had ended. But the vast majority of shares occurred far in advance of the Olympics, um, primarily due to P&G launching Best Job in April, which was probably timed to hit around Mother's Day. The top ads of these Olympic Games likely haven't even released yet. There's a typical social diffusion curve um, or pattern to how people share videos. The viral peak hits on the day after launch, followed by a steep decline. Um, but there are some exceptions to this, and paid distribution can help um, you know, kind of change this predicted pattern. So La 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 Brazil, which was the most shared ad of the 2014 World Cup, it was a collaboration with Activia and Shakira. This ad had a social diffusion curve like a mountain range. The ad peaked in the first days after launch and then had multiple peaks over the World Cup season due to gossip, controversy, and a really catchy soundtrack. But this unusual social diffusion curve helped catapult La 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 Brazil to be the most shared ad of 2014, and even the most shared ad of all time for about six months. It unseated um, Volkswagen's ad, uh, The Forest, which had that little Darth Vader from the Super Bowl in 2011, which was the reigning champion for years. So within a couple of months, right, Shakira and Activia knocked it off the podium. Will another world sporting event hosted in Brazil give us a new most shared ad of all time? We'll have to wait and see. Number nine, it is so important to advertise on consumers' terms. We talked about clutter earlier. There is an incredibly cluttered landscape, not only in terms of content, but also in terms of the number of platforms and devices and you know, how people are bouncing amongst all of these in any given day. Consumers have more choice than ever before, so it's important to forge a positive relationship with them and then advertise to interested people on their terms. Two-thirds of people want to be in control of their video ad experience. Um, here I'm sharing some data from a study that we launched where we surveyed 3,200 people around the world to see what they loved, hate, and wanted from the future of video ads and most of them wanted control of their ad experience. They wanted to be able to start, stop, pause, mute their players, you know, really control um, how the ad was running. People don't like ads that autoplay with sound, and 81% say that they sometimes, often, or always will mute these ads. People also hate forced pre-roll, so much that 61% of people are actually angry at the brand when forced to sit through it. So with a large number of ad formats and pricing models available, there's no reason to ever force the ad view, especially if you're buying on a CPCV basis, which is cost per completed view. You only pay if a person has watched your ad through to completion or for 30 seconds, whichever comes first. So if today is not the day to engage your ideal target, let him or her walk away. Engage him when it's good for him and only pay then too. So here is an example of Unruly's user-friendly ad formats, and these are ad formats that exist throughout the video ecosystem. Um, but what's special about these is we don't force the ad view. All ads are opt-in or skippable. They never autoplay with sound on and are in line with people's preferred video ad consumption. So however you choose to launch your online videos, please, for the love of consumers everywhere and the sustainability of the video ecosystem, 
Please use respectful formats and polite placements that will engage your targets on their preferred terms. Last tip, number 10, use the content stack. This is a great opportunity to make marketing more personal. So just as an Olympic coach strategically builds his or her team from a group of killer individuals, sponsors and other advertisers need to do this with a stack of content. Each piece serves a purpose and will keep viewers engaging with your brand. Due to the length of the Olympics, it's easy to suffer from ad fatigue over the 17 days especially as Summer Games content tends to launch so early. So this is a great opportunity to refresh your content and know that video of any length can engage. You can launch your PVCs online, your TV commercials, or a six-second Vine, or your InstaVid, or you know, a made-for-social you know, one to three-plus minute short film. All of this will work, and as we saw earlier with the timing slide, each new ad that launches will you know, give you a bump in activity. You'll get a new viral peak with each new piece of content launching. This is going to be a multi-screen Olympics, so consider longer cuts of your top ads for social and also consider your global audience. Testing will be more important than ever. If you have multiple pieces of content, as we do here in this example from Nike on the screen, um, you can see which is most engaging for different audiences and then choose to back those with budget if you're, you know, don't have the budget to back every single piece of content. So you can release multiple pieces at a time as well in a different strategy. So that's what Nike's been doing. Um, they have a content stack of ads featuring athletes from around the world to appeal to these different territories in which they're selling shoes. You might also want to consider reserving some budget for agile opportunities, such as a surprise underdog win or geo-targeting or a boost of ads in um, different territories, different states, different counties, depending on you know, surprising things that are happening with athletes or unexpected moments. Um, Germany did a great job of this. There was a, a beer brand that in the World Cup uh, created a, a short ad, it was about six seconds, and it showed this giant beer sign you know, crushing um, a decorative Brazilian Cosmo, um, commemorating a surprise soccer win. So again, right, we're going to bookend here with Michaela. Um, be consistent and authentic, or your viewers will not be impressed. 76% of viewers lose trust if an ad feels fake. So be consistent in your brand messaging across your content stack and authentic with everything that you launch. So here we'll do a quick video deep dive. This is the Rule Yourself ad from Under Armour. So Under Armour is not an official Olympic sponsor. Um, it's worth noting that. And this is one of the ads that we've tested um, to learn from so far this year. So here we can see that it has a share rank score of 7.3. So in the average range, it has a minimum predicted share rate of about 1.5%. Um, so we're looking at shares as a percentage of views, um, kind of to normalize for budget. But on average, a video with a share rank score of 7.3 would hit about 4, 4.5% um, share rate. The actual share rate for this video so far is 3.5%. And this ad is going to have so many zeitgeist opportunities throughout the game. Um, as we can see, it stars swimmer Michael Phelps returns for what could possibly be his final Olympic Games, and he's going to get a ton of coverage. This ad also, just in its short time of being out, has become the, most, uh, the third most shared Olympic ad of all time. Um, so we have a new ad atop the podium. And it also recently won a Grand Prix at camp. So I'm going to show you some data um, that just shows how different demographics have engaged with this ad. So I am not saying that Under Armour is necessarily targeting millennials versus boomers. Um, but it's interesting to see how different demographics can engage different emotions when watching the exact same content. So millennials and um, boomers felt inspiration and amazement, but millennials also felt happiness and surprise, whereas boomers felt more warmth and exhilaration kind of rising into their top emotions. It's also worth noting that while not a very common emotion for millennials, nearly a quarter of old, the older demographics felt confused while watching the video. So that's a really important watch out if Under Armour were to include older audiences amongst their targets. 
We also test for brand recall, right? If you're investing in a video campaign, we're really hoping, we're rooting for you that people will remember the brand behind it and be able to you know, enter you into their consideration set. So in this case, there was a large difference in brand recall between millennials and boomers. 74% of, of millennials recognized the brand in the video or remembered the brand in the video after the fact, while 86% of boomers did. U.S. norm recall, um, brand recall is about 75% just to help put this in perspective. So it really resonated well for boomers. Um, in addition, 13% of millennials didn't even think there was a brand associated with the video. So that is something to watch out for. Uh, we didn't talk about the trends of celebrity just in the interest of time, uh, but celebrities can be distracting and people will be so focused on the celeb in your video that they might not pay attention to some of the other branding going on around it, and this might have happened for um, millennials in this case. So this is an opportunity to be sure to strongly brand your player, especially for younger demographics. Really easy to add a logo to the corner or a brand bar to help boost this level. Different demos will, of course, share differently. So in this case, millennials had a wide range of platforms that they said they would share this add-on, with Facebook, Twitter, and Google Plus um, taking the podium in this case. And this is unusual. We very often see um, apps resonating more, but in this case, Facebook, Twitter, and Google Plus. Um, when it came to boomers, you know, we're down to three platforms, um, Facebook, email, and then text messaging. So in the spirit of our earlier steps, you know, this is what you should consider when distributing your ad where your audiences are already consuming content, and then customizing your player to make it easy and seamless for them to share. This is a great way to kind of get to that share rank amplification zone. So now I'm going to share a little bit more about launching ads to the people who love them best. So we use Unruly Custom Audiences for this. It's our emotional distribution tool. So we test 500 people in a NatRep sample and then sift through the results to find the most emotionally relevant subset of a brand's target audience. These are the people who are having a stronger emotional reaction to content. Um, and they behave differently. So in the case of this Under Armour um, Michael Phelps ad, the audiences that would be targeted with Unruly Custom Audience had increased brand favorability. So nearly double the number of people after watching this ad in the custom audience felt better about Under Armour as a result. And they were also much more likely to increase their intent to buy. So again, nearly double the number of people in the custom audience, the more emotionally resonant audience, say they would go out and buy the product. Um, you can also see here, we're looking at a custom audience sample of 172 people versus a NAT rep sample of close to 600 people. So then, the next step would be to model out these more emotionally engaged audiences using our first and then third party data and create a data segment to reach these highly engaged bullseye targets to help advertisers boost the ROI from their video campaign. So if you want to go the extra mile for goals, a few things to think about. You know, what is going to be the real zeitgeist? You know, keep it positive. Positive ads tend to share um, better than ads that are kind of neutral or negative. So you could consider using the empowerment trends and also think about the other things specifically taking place in Brazil, the juxtaposition of the economic, health, and political crises going on right now um, against the celebration of the games and the athletes' triumphs that we're going to see. Um, this is an opportunity to take what could be a negative, um, you know, all the talk of the Zika virus, for example, and turn it into a positive statement about health or about world health. Be agile. Save budget to hop on a trend. People love that if it's authentic for your brand. The games are long, and this agility will help advertisers retain their audience's attention and momentum over the course of the game. Leverage the personal stories, the goal of marketing, the reason we're testing, you know, some of the reason for um, using programmatic advertising is to make marketing personal, personal and deliver it to the people who are most likely to love it. So tell some average Joe advertising stories. Target people based on athletes' hometowns or countries. Um, leverage live streaming. Facebook ads has had its moment in the sun with Chewbacca Mom, and brands should be looking to kind of have their own moment with that and tell impromptu stories and connect with people on a personal level. Make sure to use the growing video toolkit. There's more video and video ad formats and platforms than ever before. And again, you know, I can't say this enough. Um, be authentic when leveraging all of the above. 
So I'm going to end now with a few predictions for you. Um, number one, we think we're going to see a, a new most shared Olympic ad of all time surface in the Rio Games. Um, and we also expect to see P&G on the podium again. They have an incredibly strong Olympic track record. And their ad, Strong, has already um, become the, most, the fifth most shared ad, Olympics ad, of all time, with over 300,000 shares to date. We're expecting someone will tap into the Zika zeitgeist. Um, Non-sponsors are likely going to outshare sponsors, and there's bound to be more of them. And then we're really rooting for Michael Phelps. We're hoping that he's going to win um, a gold medal come Rio. So that's it. Thanks for watching. And if anyone has any questions, I believe you can enter them. And we'll wait a moment. There is a slight delay with questions appearing in our dashboard. It's really fun looking at all of your um, answers to the quiz questions. Looks like a lot of people got behind Nike, the Olympics tie-in. All right, so here is a question. How are sponsors reacting to the notion that more non-sponsors are advertising during the Games? I haven't seen anything coming directly from the sponsors, um, but this is something that happens every Olympics and every World Cup, so it's nothing new. And if anything, it just makes, um, it makes it more important for sponsors to make the most of this incredibly expensive investment and make sure that they're producing their best possible content, taking all of these steps into consideration, hopefully testing their ads in advance, um, reaping the learnings of it. So there are a number of testing tools available at Unruly. We use Unruly ShareRank. Um, this is where we test ads to an audience of 500 people, including a brand's target audience, and kind of compare the target response to a nat rep response. And we produce a 40-page insight report to help sponsors um, do more of what's working, right? We can see what's resonating. Um, and also share what some of the negative points are, where people aren't engaging and leaning in, opportunities to potentially um, make edits if they're still in that phase, or to correct with things that you can manage in the distribution process. All right, well, I also have my contact info up here on the screen, and if anyone has any questions that occur to you after the fact, please feel free to reach out. Um, it's been a pleasure presenting our Olympics insights, and a huge thanks to LMT for inviting us to participate today. Thank you so much. <laughs>